We hear about it all the time. An era marked by the rule of law, long for by a hundred generations, as President Bush said. The recent war in Iraq was fought for the stability of the new world order. Americans are wondering, what does new world order mean? The phrase new world order has been around for decades. This book was written in 1920, calling for international controls. It was Nelson Rockefeller's goal in 1968. Fidel Castro demanded it at the United Nations in 1979. Mikhail Gorbachev urged it at Stanford University in 1990. And now look who's calling for it. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order. The new world order, is it something we should eagerly anticipate or is it something we should dread? Will it usher in an era of peace and understanding or will it transform the world into a place where the living will envy the dead? What has been the role of Vatican II in the post-conciliar church in the development of the new world order? What has been John Paul II's involvement? And what about the recent events in the Soviet Union? Should we be rejoicing or are they grim harbingers of the appearance of a charismatic leader who will promote the idea of a paradise on earth, the Antichrist? I'm Julius Smetona. This is what Catholics believe. With me today to discuss the New World Order are Don Julius, a parishioner at St. Therese of the Child Jesus Church in Parma, Ohio, and a Soviet watchdog by profession. Father William Jenkins, pastor of St. Teresa of the Child Jesus Church in Parham, Ohio, and Father Clarence Kelly, spiritual director of St. Joseph's Novitiate in Round Top, New York, a congregation of traditional Catholic sisters. Don, perhaps I can begin with you. What, you know, we hear about New World Order all the time, but it's almost to the level of a platitude. What is it? No one ever tells us what it is. In the secular arena, Julius, the, one, the New World Order means one world government under socialism. And I think the way to uh, further define that is the president on January 24th, matter of fact, very shortly after the, the blurb we saw on the television there, uh, made the statement, what was and is at stake is the promise of a New World Order based upon the rule of law. And the rule of law is a key phrase there also because as we traditionally perceive the rule of law under Christian civilization and as America was set up, our rights were given to us by God and the proper function of government and law was to protect those rights. When the president uses that terminology, rule of law in association with the new world order, God is kicked completely out of the picture. Our rights, instead of being given to us by God, then become privileges granted by the state to be withdrawn whenever the state thinks it's appropriate to withdraw them. Father Kelly, from your perspective, what is this new world <clears throat> order? I think the new world order is the longed for, sought after, and most desired state which the secret societies of Europe proposed, <clears throat> excuse me, proposed as uh, the opposite choice of the Catholic Church. The Church of Christ, the Catholic Church, is universal. It is for all men, for all times. It is the means of salvation. And the New World Order, or what is sometimes referred to as the Universal Republic of the World, is, uh, is the opposite of that. It's a secular substitute for the Kingdom of God on Earth. And any group that would propose an order other than the order established by God and by his incarnate son proposes a pagan order. And as St. Paul said, the God of the pagans are demons. So what I think it portends is what Don said, a universal socialist regime where the state has supreme authority over all the governments of the world, which will be subordinate to this universal government. And this universal government will have the military and police power to impose upon every state of the world its decisions. And that is the key, I believe, to understanding President Bush's references to the war in Iraq. He said the purpose of this war 
is to help bring about this new world order. Well, how would our going to war against the despot in Iraq help to bring about a new world order? It helps to bring about a new world order because it sets a precedent for the United Nations, which will be the government of this new world order. Now the United Nations, by this precedent, has a right to step in and say, in a given case, we do not like what's going on in this country or this country, and we're going to pass a resolution to condemn it. And if you do not conform to this particular resolution, we will use police power and military power to impose the rule of law established by the government of the world. Now, I think we may be a few years away from that, but I believe that is exactly what President Bush had in mind, that the United Nations now has set a precedent for using military power to impose its decision upon a particular government. Now, everybody was in favor of it because Saddam Hussein is a monster, right? I mean, he's painted that way. Everybody's in favor of it. Of course, uh, they always do that, you know? In other words, if you want to set a precedent, you don't, you don't set up like the most virtuous person that you can right. imagine and then impose by police power your will on him. You pick someone like Saddam Hussein, who is no better or no worse than, you know, most socialist uh, dictators throughout the world. I mean, the conditions of repression in Saudi Arabia were far greater than in uh, Iraq. In Iraq, for example, Jews were permitted to practice their faith. Catholics, for the first time in a very long time, were permitted to practice their faith. I mean, I'm no advocate of Saddam Hussein. I'm just saying that they use people like him and paint him in a certain way in order to lend a justification to their action. But that's what I believe. It is a one-world socialist Antichrist state, that's the essential ingredient, an antichrist state uh, which they hope to and have longed for and have worked for at least over the last two centuries, the secret societies and the Masons, the Freemasons. Father Jenkins, uh, you recently gave a talk on John Paul II and the Vatican and, and the New World Order. I believe it's relatively unknown that one of the organizations and institutions which has long been, or within the last 25 years, promoting this new world order has been the post-conciliar church. Julius, that's true. And uh, that videotaped segment that we saw a few moments ago showed Rockefeller's involvement, Castro's involvement, uh, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev's call for a new world order. It didn't mention a number of other calls by presidents of nations recently for a new world order. But uh, what is not generally known is that uh, the uh, Second Vatican Council uh, called for a new world order, called for a one world government with the police powers necessarily necessary to enforce its will over the world. In fact, I can read you some uh, quotations from the last document approved at Vatican II. It's the document called Gaudium et Spes. It's a dogmatic constitution, so-called, on the church in the modern world. And that was finally approved on December 7, 1965. And I'll just read you some of the statements made by Vatican II in that document. Uh, the fathers at the council said, we must place before our eyes the unification of the world and the duty imposed on us to build up a better world in truth and justice. We are witnessing then the birth of a new humanism where man is defined before all else by his responsibility to his brothers and at the court of history. Now, for a, a council, an ecumenical council of what purports to be the Catholic Church, to say that man is defined before all else by responsibility to his brothers and the court of history? What about God? There's no mention of that. And this gets down to what Don was saying about the rule of law, because when they start uh, talking about the United Nations as being the world government, the executive power of this new world government, that's where they start praising the Declaration, the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Man. And if you read through the provisions of the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Man, which is so uh, widely touted and, and, and highly uh, regarded by Paul, John Paul II and Paul VI before him, you'll see that provision after provision in the Declaration of the Rights of Man of the United Nations says that men will have these rights except where provided otherwise by law. And so everything is granted 
by the law. There are no rights that man has by nature. Uh, Vatican II said in, in that document, uh, the dogmatic constitution of the church in the modern world, number 82, it is our clear duty to spare no effort in order to work for the moment when all war will be completely outlawed by international agreement. This goal, of course, requires the establishment of a universally acknowledged public authority vested with the effective power to ensure security for all, regardless for justice and respect for law. And it goes on to talk about the community of all men, a worldwide community, uh, an economic order on a worldwide scale, abolishing nationalistic ambitions, taking precedence over the laws of nations and the desires of nations. The effort to establish a universal brotherhood will not be in vain. Now, these words could have been spoken by any Masonic Lodge. But this call by the Second Vatican Council for a universal world government has already been put into place uh, to a great extent. The creation of the world court in the Hague in the Netherlands already has the ju judiciary powers to judge. But what has been lacking has been the, the uh, executive power to actually command compliance with an order or to suffer uh, force, to compel compliance. Mm -hmm. When you turn to Paul VI in his speech to the United Nations of October 4th, 1965, he actually uh, says that it is the chief characteristic of the United Nations to enforce human rights and he says this is what the Catholic Church aspires to be in the spiritual field. That the United Nations is unique and universal. And that the United Nations itself uh, is involved in the ideological construction of mankind. He says there is nothing superior to this on the natural level. And he calls progressively for the establishment of a world authority able to act efficaciously on the juridical and political levels. This is Paul VI calling for this in his speech before the United Nations. And John Paul II recently said the same thing. He recently called for, as a matter of fact, in his address to the uh, armed forces of Italy, uh, to a place called Cecagnola in Italy, near Rome. This was April 2nd. In uh, 1979, I believe it was, this is what he said, 1989, April 2nd, 1989, he called for the establishment of a world authority which would have the necessary police powers to enforce its will upon nations of the world. And he said that national armed forces have to be progressively disarmed in favor of this world authority. That's very interesting. You're watching what Catholics believe we're discussing the new world. Getting back to the question of the New World Order, uh, I'd like to get into the, what happened in the Soviet Union recently, but just to touch upon John Paul II's involvement a little more, uh, we have numerous photographs. Uh, John Paul II in 1983 greeted the Trilateral Commission, which held their 10th plenary conference of all places in the Vatican. He praised their work. Uh, he met with Gorbachev uh, not too long ago, shook his hand, and at, both, at the time, both men said that they have a similar view of, of the emerging world. Uh, just recently, uh, in these events, he wrote, uh, sent a, a telegram to Gorbachev after his return to power, after his three days and his resurrection, uh, saying, I wish to send you my fervent wishes for every good. I wish that you can continue the tremendous work of the material and spiritual renewal of the peoples of the Soviet Union. Father, maybe you'd like to comment finally on the fact that shortly before Castro, or right around the same time Castro made his call for the New World Order at the UN, John Paul II visited the United Nations and made a very similar appeal. It's true, Julius. John Paul II addressed the United Nations General Assembly, Special Assembly, in fact, on October 2nd, 1979. And uh, he had some interesting comments to make. Uh, I have the text of his address addressed to the 34th General Assembly of the United Nations Organization here. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, of course, because it is rather lengthy. But I thought that our viewers might be interested in what uh, 
John Paul II, uh, representing the entire almost one billion members of the uh, conciliar church created by Vatican II, had to say to the United Nations. Um, he said to the United Nations that the establishment of that organization uh, was a real milestone on the path of moral progress of humanity. And he was referring specifically to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is sort of the, uh, you might say, the Bill of Rights granted by the United Nations Organization over the world. He called it a milestone on the path of moral progress of humanity. He calls it the cornerstone of the United Nations Organization. And he goes on to say, and this is rather, rather alarming to anyone who has read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in its entirety and the Charter of the United Nations Organization. He says, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has struck a real blow against the many deep roots of war since the spirit of war in its basic primordial meaning springs up and grows to maturity where the inalienable rights of man are violated. This is directly in contradiction to the words of the Blessed Virgin Mary at Fatima, who told us that war is a punishment for sin, not rooted in man's violation of other men's rights. This, John Paul II continued, is a new and deeply relevant vision of the cause of peace, one that goes deeper and is more radical. It is a vision that sees the genesis and, in a sense, the substance of war in its more complex forms emanating from injustice viewed in all its various aspects. This injustice first attacks human rights and thereby destroys the organic unity of the social order, and it then affects the whole system of international relations. Now, this statement really struck me. Within the Church's doctrine, the encyclical Pacem in Teres by John XXIII provides in synthetic form a view of this matter that is very close to the ideological foundation of the United Nations organization. It takes a teaching of a papal encyclical, Pacem in Teres, and says it provides in synthetic form a view of the matter closely aligned with the ideological foundation of the United Nations. This must therefore form the basis to which one must loyally and perseveringly adhere in order to establish true peace on earth, the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And, Officially uh, atheistic body. Exactly. Well, they have a statue of Zeus, uh, the, the pagan god of gods, in, uh, in their atrium. And they have the, 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 what is it, the meditation room downstairs yeah. with the lodestone, uh, an occult symbol, right. with the single beam of light playing off its surface. And I'm no told question. that both Paul VI and John and Paul II <coughs> spent some time in the meditation room. Sure, and the all-seeing eye there. I'd just like to close right. with his final, final statement to the United Nations. Now, this represents to me, along with Paul VI's uh, statement about the United Nations being in the, in the natural order, what the Church aspires to be in right. the supernatural order, a kind of abdication, an abdication in favor of the United Nations as being the leader, the moral leader of mankind. The last statement John Paul II said to the United Nations General Assembly is this, I hope that the United Nations will ever remain the supreme forum of peace and justice, the authentic seat of freedom of peoples and individuals in their longing for a better future. The United Nations is a supreme forum in the hope for a better future, peace and justice in the world. The fact that a man who purports to be a Roman pontiff and the successor of Peter on earth, the vicar of Christ, would refer to a secular godless organization as this great hope of mankind and wish it to be the supreme forum of human aspirations for peace and justice is just unthinkable. You know, fathers, uh, I'd like to preface, and Mr. Julius, I'd like to preface my next question about what your feelings are about the events of the Soviet Union with a couple of interesting facts. In the 1860s, the Holy Office wrote to certain bishops in the United States, and they said specifically that the various uh, secret societies, occult organizations which spawned and promoted communism and socialism, which worked for the establishment of a new natural state, the destruction of the Catholic Church. They said something very striking, that they were physically, not spiritually, physically 
under control of Satan because he said otherwise you could not possibly explain such a connected and logical intertwined activity throughout the entire world. Now we turn to the events, uh, the recent events, which seem so confusing, and yet there seems to be some inexorable flow and progression behind them. We now hear that uh, many new Catholics say that uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary's prophecies have come true, communism is gone, Russia has been converted, hallelujah. What are your feelings, Don? Well, I would say the, the events in Russia, as the media has portrayed them to us, have been spontaneous, that this has been the people uprising and Mikhail Gorbachev repenting of past mistakes of communism and things like this. And uh, perhaps if this were true, it would be an encouragement to look forward to. But what's interesting is the script of what is taking place now actually was given to us back in 1984 when the highest ranking Soviet KGB officer ever to defect to the United States, Anatoly Galitsyn, uh, published a book entitled New Lies for Old. And when you read the chapter, Julius, entitled The Final Phase, uh, it goes into, for instance, the demolition of the Berlin Wall will be brought about, the bringing together of East and West Germany, that there will be the liberalization in the Eastern European countries, and this liberalization will be brought into the Soviet Union. The fact that a younger, seemingly more liberal leader would be brought to power in the Soviet Union. Now, again, this book was published in 1984. Mikhail Gorbachev came in in 1985. So what the frightening thing is, and the thing that we should be concerned about, is that these changes are part of the communist conquest of the world, that they are doing this to disarm the West in preparation for the final assault on what's left of uh, our country, freedom in general, and Christian civilization. Father Kelly. I think that it is uh, part of a plan. I don't know that they have absolute control over every aspect of it, and who knows what God will actually cause to happen before the final conflict. But in my opinion, what I believe they're doing is, I believe they're, they're taking out all the stops in order to bring about this new world government very quickly. They may be taking some chances. You know, whenever you, whenever you say, for example, loosen the chains up on the slaves, there's always a chance a slave might revolt. You just don't know what will happen. But nevertheless, you may do it because you want him to have the appearance of a free man rather than a slave. So I think what they're doing is, I think they have perhaps, and this is just speculation, that they have set a date that they want to bring about this new world order. And in order to bring it about, they have to do some pretty dramatic things. The, 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 the method of, for example, creating a, this international socialist uh, godless state by conquering one country after another and imposing uh, a Soviet or a Chinese type communist state on, while it was effective and while it did work to some degree, it certainly was not going to bring about this international uh, government and world order with, uh, with any great speed. So th what I think they're doing is they're letting up on the reins, as it were. They're going to draw the various governments of the world into certain type of regional alliances, and then eventually perhaps draw them all together under the United Nations, diminish the military uh, capacity of the various countries, and establish this international power. But I think above and beyond that, we have, to see, we have to see what's going on. And I think what is going on, it is, I think, it is the work of the devil setting the stage Grant. for the coming of the Antichrist. And I also think, in my opinion, what has happened as a result of the Vatican Council is that God has taken away the restrainer that St. Paul talks about in his second epistle to the Thessalonians chapter 2. He says, as it were, the church is protected by a restrainer, whether it's St. Michael the, Ar the Archangel or the Holy Ghost, we're not sure. But before the great apostasy can come, the restrainer must be taken away from the scene. The devil will have his free reign to bring about the apostasy, and the great apostasy will set the stage for the coming of the Antichrist. Father Jenkins, you've done some work in Europe under, I believe, and Father Kelly, you did too, under the historian Bernard Fay in uh, Paris, France. What, what do you make of all of these seemingly spontaneous events which unfortunately seem to be inexorably leading to this new world order? Well, I, I did not study under Bernard Fay, although I would have liked to have done so. I just discovered recently uh, one of his books that has been translated into English 
and uh, I was very pleased to see that. So people who are interested in reading can obtain his book. His last name is spelled F-A-Y. He's a French historian um, and a student of the secret societies. Uh, I think what uh, President Bush said recently is, is uh, sums it up. People asked what he thought of the events going on in the Soviet Union, and he said everything is moving in the right direction. And you notice when word came of a coup, an attempted coup in uh, the Soviet Union, in Mikhail Gorbachev had been spirited away, uh, President Bush reacted in a very calm way and uh, made a statement and then went back to hitting the golf balls. Yeah. As though everything is just just the way it should be. We, we, uh, we have all of this under control. So that some were suspecting, for example, I heard one, one traditional priest uh, turn to another when he first heard about the coup and said, watch, within a few days, Gorbachev will be back and, uh, and everything will be just wonderful. You know, uh, again, we're on, back on the track of the New World Order and so relieved that we are. Hmm. So I, I definitely think that whatever is happening now is being orchestrated uh, in the direction of the New World Order, even where they suffer setbacks, they've already taken into consideration of how to play the game so that they can turn everything to their advantage. Thank you for watching what Catholics believe. We need your support to continue.